Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. Today's webinar is Tire Safety, How to Save Lives, Improve Tire and Fuel Performance, and Help the Environment. My name is Matt Tomlinson, and I'm with Eagles Environmental Support Division. And before we turn the webinar over to our moderator, just want to go over some housekeeping issues to help you with or helps housekeeping details to help you with your experience navigating Go uh, Zoom. So first I want to remind everyone that all lines are muted during the webinar and we are also recording this session so you'll be provided a link in a, in a follow up email that gives you the recording link information. You can share that if you want to. And you have a couple of different ways that you can interact with our panelists and so to submit questions. On your Zoom toolbar, you'll see a Q&A dialogue button. You can click on that and uh, submit a question that way, and we'll address questions at appropriate breaks during the webinar. There's also a hand function. If you want to raise your hand function, we can try to unmute you and allow you to ask your question that way. And I'm just going to take a look over here and see we don't have anybody calling in on the phone. But if we do, uh, we certainly have an opportunity for somebody calling in via the phone to participate as well. And that's just using star two. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator, Deb Swartz. And uh, Deb, if you wanna take it away, introduce yourself and our presenters and uh, I'll be in the background. You bet. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I think we have a terrific webinar for you today. And um, I'm excited that we have um, a, a terrific panel here. Um, I am Debbie Swartz with the um, Sustainable Development Unit. And our unit oversees a number of um, sustainable, sustainability activities, including coordinating events like this. So with that, I would like to introduce TG Tennant and ask him to say a few words about himself. Thanks, Deb. It's good to see, see some of you, not everyone. Uh, my name's TJ Tennant, and I am the president of Tennant Associates. Most people know me as the tire guy, and uh, we are a tire forensics corporation, and we're the people that you hope you never see because something negative has happened with the tires either on your personal vehicle or somebody else's vehicle. But we also train uh, law enforcement and tire forensics all over the world. And we also certify emergency vehicle technicians. So I'm really looking forward to this interaction with you guys. Thank you, TJ. And also joining us this morning is Kirsten Clemens. Um, she's the Tire Grant Specialist with Eagle. Kirsten, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Hey, um, sure, Deb. I am actually the Scrap Tire Coordinator, which means that I deal with enforcement issues in the Scrap Tire program and also with grants. Um, enforcement issues. We look at dumping of tires and regulate the regulated community, which is haulers and collection sites of tires. So nice to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Kirsten. All right. Well, to kick things off, um, I'd just kind of like to bring your attention to the, the connection that we have between proper tire maintenance safety and the environment. Um, if you think about our, our mission, um, it's, it's very important to protect public health and the environment. And this webinar today actually is leading up to National Tire Safety Week, which is June 28th through July 4th. And that is a, a, a National Tire Safety Week is an annual industry-led initiative designed to help consumers learn steps for proper tire care and maintenance. Um, and when you think about it, proper tire care and maintenance and disposal has direct connection to Michigan's, um, our, our Eagle's mission to protect the environment and public health by managing our air, water, land, and energy resources. So today in the webinar, you're going to learn about you know, how to properly maintain your tires, and that will certainly um, conserve fuel and reduce emissions if your tires are maintained properly and have the proper um, air pressure, which TJ will tell you all about. Um, properly maintaining your tires will also help to extend the life of the tire. And if you use your tires longer, clearly that will help to reduce waste. Um, there are other issues related to tire maintenance um, um, concerning contaminant runoff into waterways. There are certain chemicals, heavy metals, 
and even a tire preservative um, that is um, toxic to some fish populations. And um, with runoff, it could certainly impact our waterways, especially if you think about um, if we were to have a, a fire at a scrap tire or a, a tire facility that are um, where tires are being stockpiled, the water, the runoff from that could significantly impact our waterways. In addition to that, um, we're also going to teach you about how you can collect your scrap tires for recycling um, because they cannot be disposed of in a dumpster. Um, it's actually been, um, that's been banned since 2004. And so we're also gonna tell you how you can, you know, dispose of them in a, in a proper manner that is sustainable. So um, with that, I would like to um, hand things over to TJ and have him take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. And I guess everybody can see it. But again, my name's TJ Tennant. And you know, when people hear that a tire guy is coming on board to talk about tires, they think it's gonna be really boring. Well, I'm not a really bored guy or even boring for that matter. I'm not on drugs or anything. I really, really love what I do. And you guys are gonna learn so much about tires today. But what I want everyone to think about, since this is more of an environmental uh, presentation, is on your way home today, and I don't recommend you do this, but think about grabbing a 55 gallon drum of a used oil or some fuel and pouring it in your backyard. Now, of course, no one here would do something like that, but that's the same thing that happens when you don't maintain your tires properly and they go into a scrap yard early in the tire's life. So, it, and when I say main, tire maintenance, that, that means more than just air pressure. That means rotation, it means alignment, and all the things necessary to get the full life out of your tires. And the more life you get out of the tires, the less we're gonna have in landfills. So every time you hear me say the word tire, or especially the word air pressure, think about the environmental consequences of not maintaining your tires properly. So as everyone knows, or hopefully knows, or will know after this presentation is done, uh, there's basically two different types of tires in all over the world as far as consumers are concerned. There's also commercial equipment. We're going to touch on that a little bit. But to help you understand the language of tires, I'm going to try to help you guys become a little bit of a, a tire whisperer today. And so we're going to talk about a passenger and a light truck tire. So the P means obviously it's a passenger car tire. And the three digits after that are actually the section width. Most people think it's the width of the tread. It is not the width of the tread. It is the width of the tire from sidewall to sidewall when the tire is inflated on the proper size rim, not including the white letters or the, the white walls or anything like that. And it's gonna be in millimeters. The next digit is the aspect ratio. And that's the height of the tire when it's new by, uh, by percentage. So that means the height of this tire from the top of the tread to the bottom of the bead down here is 60% of the width, the section width of the tire. And of course, you can have an R here, which means radial. You might also see a B, not necessarily on passenger and light truck, but you could see it on motorcycles and some commercial vehicles. And that B means it's, it's biased belted. And in some cases, you might even see a horizontal dash there. And that means the tire's bias no belt. And then obviously at the end is the rim size. And then there's light truck, which starts with an LT. And there may be some others that you, other letters that you may see in front of the tire size, like an ST, which is usually on a trailer tire or T for temporary spare or something like that. There are others, but we're not gonna get into those because we're restricted on time a little bit today. Oompa, oompa, oompa I've got another puzzle for you. <laughs> I love that song. That song, and I'm showing my age a little bit, is from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Not the new one with Johnny Depp, but the real Willy Wonka that had Gene Wilder in it. Because that's the real one because the Oompa Loompas are different sizes and they don't look alike. They're not the computer generated Oompa Loompas that you see with the one that Johnny Depp did. If you ever see an Oompa Loompa, you can ask them because they all look different. <laughs> I just had to say that. But tires are a riddle to a lot of people. Most people think they're just black and round and they, we just punch them out like donuts. It's not 
that way at all. Tires are very complex pieces of equipment and depending on what the application is, they can be extremely complex from a race car tire from like Formula One or the Indy 500 or NASCAR to even a tire on your lawnmower. But all of them, we wanna get the most life out of, out of them as we can to make sure that we use them up so they don't go into landfills. There are other operations that are starting to come up to where uh, the tire manufacturers are starting to try to understand how to recycle tires, but that's still sort of in its infancy. One of the things that I wanna talk about is load index. And I said earlier that you never wanna see me outside of a venue like this. That is very true because then we're probably in court and me and my team of engineers and technical experts actually do a lot of uh, testifying in court, in court as expert witnesses with unfortunately people just like all of you out there who think that, well, I'll probably never wind up in court. Well, hopefully that's true, but everyone is always surprised when we show up. So as we talk about load index, load index is actually two things. It's numerical inside of uh, the parentheses and it can range anywhere from one to actually more than 150 now, and then it's gonna be alpha. The numerical cor correlates to the load table the alpha correlates to the speed table. And some of you know as speed rating or something like that. And it is a rating. So in this particular case with this tire and in most passenger P metric tires, whether they're passenger or light truck, you will see something like this. And in this particular instance, the 87 correlates to the maximum load carrying capacity of that one tire at maximum pressure. Because of this tire size, maximum pressure on it may be as low as 51 PSI. So that means this tire will carry 1,201 pounds at 51 PSI. Now, if you put more than 51, that little print you see on the sidewall, it's not going to carry any more weight and that could be extremely dangerous. I never recommend going higher than what's printed on the sidewall of the tire. And some people have the question, well, if if I see the, the maximum pressure on the sidewall of the tire, does that correlate to what's on the door placard? They are almost always different. And if you don't know which one to follow, always, always, always follow what's on the, the door placard of the vehicle, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And or you can also contact your, your authorized tire dealer or the, the tire brand itself. Now, next is the speed rating. And that's really, really important to follow. Say, and usually when I'm in a store or something, and I'll give you an example, the other day, this lady came by and she had her son with her, teenage son, he's driving a Mustang GT, it's got a V8 engine. And she's saying, well, you know, he doesn't need the, the V speed rating, we can drop it to an H or U because he doesn't drive 149 miles an hour. Well, it's not about maximum speed. It's more about the handling of the, of the, the vehicle and the tire assembly working together to make the vehicle do what it's designed to do. The only time that you should drop in speed ratings is you can drop one speed rating, but you should you can only drop two speed ratings if you're going to a winter tire. Up in Michigan, you guys know a lot more than probably I, even I do about winter tires because I live down here in sunny Nashville and we have maybe six snow days a year. But I'm gonna explain to you about winter tires later. It's not just about snow and ice, it's more relative to temperature. Now, pressure effects on fuel economy. It is really, 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 really important to maintain your tire pressure. And here's an example. This particular vehicle requires about 30 PSI. It's a large sedan or minivan in this size. If you go over the recommended tire pressure for this vehicle by the load that it's carrying, you're not going to help your fuel economy a whole lot. You'll help with maybe 0.75 miles per gallon increase in fuel economy. But if you don't have the proper pressure in your tires, especially for, for any vehicle, even if it's not one of these, you can significantly, and I do mean significantly, hurt the fuel economy on your vehicle. In this next slide, it talks about the wear. And that's really what most people care about unless you own a, an EV, an, emergency, an electric vehicle or hybrid vehicle. People with uh, contemporary vehicles like mass market, Toyota Camrys and things like that, they're more concerned with mileage for the most part. 
And again, if you, you this particular chart is indexed at, at 100, so let's take for instance, it may be the same vehicle. If you lose five PSI and you don't check the air pressure, you can lose 10% of the wear life of that tire. The conventional mass market tire may get 40,000 miles. For 4,000 miles doesn't seem like a lot, but if you lose 10 PSI, you're gonna lose 40% of the wear life. So instead of uh, 40,000 miles out of that set of tires, for example, you're gonna be down to 24,000 miles. And that is a significant drop off in tire wear. Tires are not fun to purchase. They can be very, very expensive depending on the vehicle and application. And people don't usually think about them until it's time to get some more. Very few people actually check their tire pressure. And one of the other questions I wanna ask you guys is how many of you have checked the air pressure in the temporary spare on your vehicle? Almost no one checks that. And then something happens, they've got to install that temporary spare and then they're down a second time on the same freeway because either there's no air in the temporary spare or there's not enough air to carry the load and then that tire fails. Or number three, which is also common in an older vehicle, that that tire is very old. It could be 10 or more years old, and we'll talk about that a little later. Now, rolling resistance is important, usually in the commercial application, but to some people who drive uh, EVs, emergency uh, electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, rolling resistance can be important to them as well. And again, if you increase the air pressure, which I don't recommend over the design specification, which you can find on the door placard, yeah, you can get a, little, a lot less rolling resistance, but you induce wear on the tire in the center of the tread. But if you go down on air pressure from the design spec, you can actually induce shoulder edge wear on the tires. Either one just as bad, especially in wet weather, you increase your braking distance, which could be detrimental to someone's life. So it's really important to understand what the air pressure is in your vehicle and sh or should be. And you can get that information through one of two places in your owner's manual or on the door placard, which is usually on the door sill of uh, your vehicle on the driver's side. Now, some people think, well, I've got a TPMS, a tire pressure monitoring system. I just wait till the light comes on <laughs> before I check it. That is not a good idea either. There's two types of TPMS systems. In the newer vehicles, they have a direct system, which actually shows the actual pressure in the tire that's low or whatever within the, the specs on the TPMS. But then there's indirect, which works with your anti-lock braking system. And it just says, gives you this idiot light that says, hey, you need to check your tires because one of them may be low. Now, the reason that it's not recommended to wait until that light or that buzzer comes on with TPMS, because that buzzer can come on at as low as 20, 20 to 25% of insufficient air pressure to carry the load. Now, the, some of the sanctioning bodies for tires, the United States Tire Manufacturers Association, TIA, which is the Tire Industry Association, ATA, the American Trucking Association, they all say anytime a tire is run, at 20% or more with insufficient air pressure to carry the load, you have now damaged that tire beyond repair and it needs to be replaced. So if you continually wait until that TPMS light comes on, you can do a cumulative damage to that tire until eventually that tire fails. Then they call someone like me and I say, hey, I can believe it or not, me and my team can look at a tire and we can determine if you properly maintain the tire, or if the tire was damaged in the accident or in the incident, or something else such as a road hazard. So it's really, really important to check your tire pressure monthly and check it cold. And when I say cold, that doesn't mean you should dip the tire in ice. What that means, it should be uh, checked at ambient temperature. So most vehicles, light trucks, passenger car tires are going to lose one PSI per month. So if you go six months without checking the air pressure, you're going to lose six PSI. And in a vehicle that requires 35 PSI as a recommended uh, air pressure, you're right at that 20% mark and right at that point to where your TPMS light is getting ready to engage. Commercial trucks will lose approximately two PSI per month. So it's equally important to check the air pressure monthly on a passenger car or a light truck or a commercial truck. Also, you're looking for any cuts or tears or anything like that in the tire that could re retire, 
required the tire to be removed from, ser from service. Now, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is you will also lose one PSI for every 10 degree drop in ambient temperature. So in the fall, when it's warm during the day and then it's cold at night and you get up the next morning, your TPMS lights on and on your way to work, the light goes out. It goes out because the tire is starting to warm up to uh, its required pressure. Now, should you increase the air pressure once that light comes on? You can do that if you've got some way of doing it in your garage, but never add air to the tire once it's warmed up. It really needs to be at ambient temperature. So nitrogen, let's talk about that. Uh, sometimes you buy a new car and you see the little green cap on your valve stem. That means the tire has been uh, at some point filled with nitrogen. It doesn't necessarily mean it has nitrogen in it because some people if you can't find a nitrogen station, they're gonna add compressed air from one of the gas stations or something like that. And then I had a guy recently asked me, well, should I use nitrogen? Is it better than compressed air? And one guy said, well, I heard the molecules in nitrogen were bigger, so it doesn't lose as much air or air as rapidly as comp compressed air. Well, I would really like to see the calipers that he measured those molecules with. <laughs> those, I gotta get a set of them. So to answer that, those questions, yes, nitrogen is slightly, slightly, ever so slightly, a nitrogen molecule is a little bit larger than an air molecule. But, but, big but, in the course of six months or, or, or a year, if you put nitrogen in one tire and compressed air in the other, the nitrogen over the course of six months might lose one half pound less air than the compressed air uh, tire would lose. Now, if, do I recommend nitrogen? Of course, it, it reduces wheel corrosion because there's no moisture in it. It prevents uh, inner liner rubber deterioration again because there's no moisture in it. And the tires run cooler again because there's no moisture in nitrogen to conduct heat and make the tire run hotter or colder or, or grow or shrink as the, air, the water molecules increase and decrease. The bad part about nitrogen is it costs money and then what percentage of nitrogen are you paying for? We're breathing about 78% nitrogen in the air that we're breathing every day, 16% oxygen, and about 6% other impurities, unless you live in LA, and then maybe it's 16% 6, impurities and 6% uh, uh, oxygen. But, and hopefully there are no attorneys on here. I'm sure there are. So I'm going to qualify myself really, really quickly by saying I don't recommend this. So there's a way to tell if you really have nitrogen in your air is find a person, I guess you don't like that much and have them breathe on it. If they don't die, it's, it's really, it's compressed air. I don't recommend that though. Also, there's a process to installing nitrogen into a tire. And that means the tire has to be vacuumed out and filled with nitrogen three times per tire. I've never seen that done. I not even when they knew who I was, when I walked in the store, they just, basically topped off your oxygen with nitrogen or bled the tire down and then topped it off with nitrogen and put a green cap. Or in the worst case scenario I've seen, they put compressed air in there and put a green cap on there. So uh, if you can use nitrogen, yes, I recommend it. Uh, but if you can't, as long as the compressed air is dry, they drain the tank and change the dryer, compressed air is just as good on the city streets. Now, uh, I was just asked this question today, believe it or not, before I got on this webinar from some, uh, 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 actually an automobile uh, brand there in Michigan, their corporate office in Michigan, about putting a different uh, tread depth tire on one axle versus the other. And my answer to them was, if you've got two tires on the same axle, one has 10, 30 seconds and one has more, less than eight, then you really got to change one of them out because it's going to be an issue with hydroplaning. So speaking of hydroplaning, what's the best case scenario? The best case scenario when it's time to replace two tires, for instance, and this happens a lot in fleets and in some uh, owners where if they don't maintain the tires properly, the, the especially the front wheel drive, the, the front tires will will wear out quicker than the rear because you've got a drive axle and a steer axle and that just creates all kinds of weird things that wears the tire down. So 
what's the best case scenario when you got to replace just two? Do you put them on the steer axle or on the drive axle? Well, the best case scenario is to put four on the vehicle, all four at the same time, but that's not always practical. So the question is, if you've got to replace two tires, and if you only got to do have to do two, you want to do them by axle, do you put them on the front axle or the rear axle? Let's talk about the physics of this. Here's the situation, and it's usually in the wet, in a curve. And the way that this works is that you're going into a curve, you realize you're going too fast in the rain or in the wet or standing water. If you've got four tires on there, uh, understeer is designed into every vehicle as for safety. So this is what can happen. You, you're going in too hot, and you don't hit the brakes, you just let off the throttle, and then the center of gravity transfers to the front of the vehicle and the rearing gets light, but you got four brand new tires on the vehicle, so no major issues there. The old school way of thinking was to put the new tires on the front or on the steer axle, or some people say on the drive. But when you do that, you put the, new, the two new tires on the front, which one has better traction, the new tire or the tire that's been worn down? Obviously the new tire. So same uh, physical occurrence, you've got the new tires on the front, the used tires on the rear, as you slow down for that curve, the front of the vehicle presses the tires down, they're new, the rear of the vehicle gets light, and then it can induce oversteer. Best case scenario with only replacing two tires uh, is to put the two new tires on the rear. You've got the worn down tires on the, on the front. So as you realize, hey, I'm going too fast into this curve, uh, you let off the throttle, the front of the vehicle starts to press down on the used tires, which have less wet weather traction. The rear end gets light. You've got the best traction on the rear. It induces understeer, which is what is designed into most vehicles. Now, as I was saying earlier, here in Nashville, uh, typically most people will use an all season or summer tire. Very rarely here gets below 40 degrees. Now, where you, all of you are, or most of you are, in the great state of Michigan, 40 degrees is probably almost summer for you guys. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> so you guys will have a lot more experience with winter tires up there than we ever would down here in the great, beautiful state of Tennessee. So I want to explain some things about tires, the difference between a winter and all season and a summer tire. Tires are made of rubber so they conform to the road surface. That's the only reason. Otherwise, we could be on the same tires that, that trains you. <laughs> of course, you'd have a really low rolling resistance coefficient. But pursuit tires, police tires, most of them, when it's not snowing and iced outside, are usually uh, quali qualified as a summer tire. Some manufacturers, Goodyear, Bridgestone, uh, BFG, have developed all-season tires, and you use those in the summertime. Now in the winter time, it's, as I said earlier, it's not just about snow and ice. It's also about the compound on the tire and also the tread pattern. So a winter tire is gonna have a wholly different compound than a summer tire would ever have so that as the temperature gets cold, as the tire tries to do what it's designed to do and conform to the road surface, the winter tire is gonna be a whole lot more efficient in 40 degrees or less. If you try to use a summer tire, in the winter, on a lot of the high performance SUVs and sports cars, they come with a summer tire. And you're thinking, wow, in the winter time, I can drive my vehicle because it's got plenty of tread, even though it's a summer tire, that's gonna get you into some problems because that summer tire will not be as pliable in the winter and it can induce uh, some loss of control or complete loss of control of that vehicle. Now, the thing that really bothers me is the term everything, all season. That technology does not exist yet. There is no tire that performs equally well in very cold temperatures and equally in very hot temperatures. But I stand corrected. There is a tire that will do that, but you're gonna be slightly limited on maximum speed to nine miles per hour. So if you're not using these types of tracks on your vehicle, you really need to switch over in the state of Michigan. Now, I mentioned emergency vehicles earlier and also hybrid vehicles, those require a green tire or a fuel efficient tire on those vehicles. If you put a conventional tire or replace the fuel efficient tires on your, on your EV or your hybrid, you will, not maybe, not if, you will hurt the performance 
as far as miles per gallon and efficiency of that vehicle by putting that conventional tire on that vehicle. You really need to seek out uh, a tire that's designed for that emergency vehicle or uh, that hybrid vehicle that's designed for, for use on that vehicle. You can put a conventional tire on there. The price will be cheaper, but you will not uh, be able to take advantage of any of the savings that you would have if you had put the correct tire on that vehicle. Now, let's talk a little bit about tire repair. There are several organizations who set the standards on tire repair. The RMA, which is the Rubber Manufacturers Association, is now name is now changed to USTMA, which is United States Tire Manufacturers Association. TIA, which is the Tire Industry Association, if you're not sure about uh, how to repair your tires, or in a, in a situation of a lot of fleets, <clears throat> like the fleets that you guys have in your government, it's really, really, really important to ensure that they are practicing proper tire repair techniques to repair the tires on your personal vehicle or your fleet vehicle or your company owned vehicle. The manufacturers in red, <coughs> excuse me, say that in a high performance situation, when I talk about a high performance tire, these are any tires that are rated over 85 miles per hour, a tire rated in an H, a V, a W or a Y, and a Y even now is bracketed Y, and that's set for speeds in excess of 186 miles per hour. Now, the manufacturers here in black say, if you repair that tire in any way, the maximum speed is now 85 miles per hour. And this is really important if you do any repairs or have repairs done to any pursuit type vehicles in your government fleet, whether it's local city or state, it's really important to make sure that you get this one right because you will, not if, not maybe, you will endanger the life of that trooper and or other people on the road. The ones in red say that, well, within certain parameters, you can repair it and it still has the capability of operating at these very high three-figure three speeds. Well, <clears throat> if you talk to the engineers at those facilities, they will say not so much. And here's another thing I need all of you to think about. The people who do the repairs on tires. Is that the maintenance guy with all the certifications that's been there 30 years? Or is that the guy that just hired in and he's been there three days and they say, yeah, this is how you repair a tire. Typically it's the three day tire. Or in one of the providences that I worked in recently, they actually had some of the prisoners repairing the tires on the pursuit vehicles, which totally befuddles me, but hey, that's how they were doing it. So you wanna make sure that you do some type of quality checks if you repair tires uh, in-house or you have a third party, you definitely want to audit them to make sure that they're doing it properly. And speaking of proper repairs, the proper way to, to repair a passenger or a light truck tire is with a patch plug combination. It can be separate patch and plug, or it could be a little, they're, they're mounted together and it looks like a little mushroom and you push them through and you do the repair properly. You want to make sure you clean the surface, the surface on the inside of the tire. You have to take the tire off the wheel and make sure that you've prepared the, the area for repair properly. You do not under any circumstances. Well, uh, let me let me clarify that. Uh, all of you have seen the little wormy glue gummy worm type plugs you can get at the corner store. Yes, if you're in a situation where you're in a bad air in a bad area and you need to get out of there, yeah, put that in. And then as quickly as possible, try to get to somewhere that can inspect that tire to see if it's capable of continued use. Now, here, this is actually worse than that because they've actually taken time to take the tire off the wheel and put the and engage the patch, but they didn't repair the injury. And if you can see these little dots, that's actually the steel belts. You've allowed water to get in there. And what happens when you get water on steel? Nothing good. <clears throat> now. Also, uh, with a passenger light truck tire, you can only repair it in this area. You cannot do uh, repairs in the shoulder or sidewall like this example on a commercial truck tire. On commercial truck tires, you actually can repair the shoulders and sidewalls, but it re requires a special type of patch, unlike the one that we just looked at on the passenger and light truck. And uh, it has to be done correctly again. The wound area has to be prepared. And the reason that you can repair a commercial truck tire on the shoulders and sidewalls because the body plies are made of steel, 
versus nylon and polyester on a passenger or a light, most light truck tires. When is a tire too old? And I want you to understand there's no law or anything that says, hey, you know, at six years or 10 years or 20 years, you got to take the tire off. There are recommendations, though, by NHTSA, which is National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. NHTSA and probably every tire manufacturer says that after six years of use, and coincidentally, that's when most of the warranties are gone on most passenger light truck tires. At six years, you have no warranty because they understand the importance of that six-year window. Uh, after six years, if you want to continue that tire in use, irregardless of how much tread is left on that tire, uh, that tire has to be removed uh, from the wheel and inspected each year up until 10 years, and then the tire be removed from service. Uh, I'm a car and a motorcycle guy. I was recently at a car show and a guy had a 57 Corvette convertible and he's like, it's oh, aren't you the tire guy? And I was like, yeah. He said, well, I got the, the tires that came on this car, the original tires from 1957, still on the car in operation. He said, what do you think about that? I said, well, I think you're probably gonna die. <laughs> So he said, why? It's got plenty of tread left. And I said, look, when was the last time you found a pencil in your house that was two years old and tried to use the eraser on that pencil? What happened? He said, it, it crumbled away. I said, and what's that eraser made of, by the way? And he said, rubber. I said, what are tires made of? He said, rubber. I said, there you go. I said, it's really important. You can go to a Coker tire or something. They can build you the tire that looks just like the big white walls that came in 57 and you can put them on this vehicle. You can keep those, but please take them out of service. We talked earlier about the door placard and what information can be found on the door placard. Basically, the, the vehicle gross vehicle weights, front, rear, and gross. You also have the recommended cold tire pressure, and it may be different front to rear, uh, even if you don't have a staggered fitment like what's on a Porsche or, or Corvette or something like that. It tells you the size rim. It also tells you the size tire and the speed rating on that tire. If you decide to go from a P metric to an LT in the same size or a bigger tire or a smaller tire or a tire in any kind of way different in construction than what's on that door placard, then these recommended air pressures are no longer of any value to you. Also, you will have to go back to your dealer, your authorized dealer, and have them reset your TPMS so that you get your alerts at the proper time with the new tire size. Do not, if the dealer isn't sure what air pressure you should run in this new tire size, you can always call the tire manufacturer, ask to speak to someone at technical services, and they can tell you exactly what pressure you should run in this new tire that's of the same size and different construction or a different size and construction uh, than you have than what came as original equipment on the vehicle. Again, here's a, a door placard from a commercial truck. And this L is not the speed rating, this is the load rating. And this is when most, almost every, uh, about 99% of the commercial vehicle owners or the fleets uh, get into trouble. They get this, the right size tire, but the wrong load range. And that is imperative for those of you uh, in the listening audience who work or deal with tires for commercial vehicles in your fleet or the fleet that you work with, or even if you own a commercial vehicle, you can't screw this one up because 99% of the commercial truck tire failures are on the steer tire. And that is almost always catastrophic. Uh, it causes that vehicle to pull to the side that the tire failed and usually into oncoming, on, oncoming traffic. And that's when I get the phone call. And then we're going to request all types of paperwork and service manuals and service dates and pre-trip inspection reports. And we're going to track down everyone that came in contact with that tire, touched it, saw it, and didn't qualify it as having the wrong load range. And things, I can just tell you, things go downhill from there. Uh, again, we talked earlier about the different uh, Prefixes on tires, you got P for passenger, LT for light truck, ST for trailer, T for temporary spare. And by the way, those of you who are out there, which is probably all of you, I need you to check the air pressure in your temporary <laughs> spare on your vehicle because I know that you haven't checked it. But also here, there is, if there's nothing there, that can be a Euro metric or a Euro commercial. And I'm going to skip through this 
part. This actually tells what happens when you go to the same size, but you go to a different configuration, a P metric to an LT on the same vehicle, which happens a lot in Michigan, especially with the hunters and stuff you have out, up there. And uh, we don't have time to really go through this because there's some other things I want to hit on. But it shows where if you had the P metric tire and, and it required 35 PSI at, to carry 2,535 pounds, if you go to an LT tire, then the pressure must be at, I can't read that on my screen, I think that should be 55. So if you continue to put 35, even though you went from a P metric to an LT, that commercial truck tire will fail. It's not if, it's not maybe, you don't have enough air pressure in it to carry the load, it is going to fail. And that is a really important fact for any of you out there who bought a, uh, a truck and you wanted more load carrying capacity, and you decided to go to an LT tire, which was is more robust, which you can do, but be aware that you now have to change the load carrying capacity on there. The same thing again with, with commercial truck tires. Uh, if you go to a bigger tire, well, this is actually wheels. Here's commercial truck tires. As you can see here, this same size tire, 315.80, you can get it in a G load range, H load range, J or L. In, incre in increasing air pressure from 95 to 130 and increasing load carrying capacity. Most people, if it comes with a J or an H, they wind up purchasing the G because it's cheaper, not realizing it's got a whole lot less load carrying capacity. And that almost guarantees, and I mean, in a commercial application, this is almost sickening to me that in, every time we get a phone call about a commercial vehicle accident, this is what happened. It was supposed to have an H or J. They decided to go with a G, whether it was the owner or the fleet manager who made that decision or the, the, the tire company or the, the logistics organization who placed the tire in there placed the incorrect tire. It almost guarantees that someone is going to have a very, very serious incident involving a serious accident or death related to someone choosing the wrong tire size, uh, tire load rating. Uh, I'm gonna go through this. There's one more thing I wanna talk about. For those of you who deal with these, these little micro vans, and I'm gonna close it out after this section, these usually require a, this is a commercial, uh, a, a met, metric commercial tire. The C is not C load range. You notice there's no P or LT in the front. You cannot put an LT or P metric tire on this vehicle. It is not even close to the load carrying capacity. And unfortunately, most of these that are on these vehicles are made by one manufacturer and there's almost always a backlog. If you have to replace it with a P metric or an LT, you can put another door placard on, but not over the original door placard. Put it underneath and so that you qualify that as having the different tires on there. We're starting to see a lot of tire failures on these vehicles because people looked at the door placard and they saw 225-75-R16C and decided, well, I can put a P metric on or an LT. And don't be shocked when the people who installed the tire had no clue of what they were doing. So I'm going to close it out there and I'm going to turn it back over to the, uh, to the group there in Michigan and uh, there's more to this presentation. If you guys are interested in seeing the rest of it, uh, Mrs. Swartz and her team and the rest of these really awesome people that are on here will send you guys, get you guys a copy of this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, TJ. That was terrific. I really appreciate it. Um, now we have some information on the scrap tire program that Kristen Clemens will share with you. Yes, hello. Um, super interesting what TJ has to say. And if at any point you can um, reduce the number of scrap tires, it would definitely be helpful um, for waste reduction in the state as we generate about 10 million scrap tires a year in Michigan alone. Um, part 169 is the program, is the statute that regulates scrap tires and has been in effect since 1991, but we do still see scrap tire piles. Okay, next slide, please. So when you ask about what does the scrap tire 
program do? We have um, staff in nine different district offices around the state that deal with um, haulers and collection sites of scrap tires. Um, that is inspecting the regulated community and making sure that they're registered correctly. Responding to complaints about tire piles and tire dumping. Um, we do some mosquito sampling of tire piles. Um, we count, we physically count and measure tire piles. So that picture on the upper right hand side is us going out with surveying equipment. The lower picture is um, newer technology for us where we can actually use a drone to um, measure a tire, tire pile. And you say, okay, well, how big is a regulated tire pile? So we regulate most tire piles that are 500 tires or more. And a tire pile that is 15 foot by 15 foot by six foot tall is approximately 500 passenger car tires. Um, we register people that collect that number of tires or have them on site, scrap tires. Um, if they have 500 tires, we also register haulers and a hauler of scrap tires would be a commercial hauler hauling more than 10 tires at a time. And they are required to register and provide a $10,000 bond to the state. Okay. So we talk about some proper uses of, of tires. Um, we actually are providing market development grant funding and we attempt to develop markets for tires so that they are not just landfilled or improperly disposed of. So um, upper left-hand corner is actually a rubber modified asphalt project and that construction barrel, the barrel base is actually the sidewall out of the semi-tire. A lot of the barrel bases in Michigan are made out of scrap tire sidewalls. Um, the project below is actually the river, ribbon cutting for that rubber modified asphalt project that was in Dickinson County in the Upper Peninsula. Um, it was a dry process rubber modified asphalt. Um, the picture with the pipes is a septic field that's using um, tire chips as drain, drain field aggregate. The picture in the upper right is rubberized mulch. And um, the, actually the border there is also extruded rubber and they dye that with a non-toxic dye. So the mulch comes in many different colors. I've seen blue, purple, the redwood colors, black, um, basic, you know, uh, dark browns and things like that. Um, there's a picture of appropriately stored tires at a tire facility. Um, we call that lacing of tires. And the bottom picture is um, tire sidewalls used on a silage tarp. Okay, next slide. Unfortunately, with the good comes the bad. Um, we do see improper hauling of tires, such as the left hand picture, where that was a non registered hauler in the city of Detroit. Um, hauling tires, more than 10 tires, they weren't registered. Um, the tires were not particular, I mean, there was a lot of tires on that vehicle, but there was no tarping or anything. So it's somewhat dangerous, tires can fall off. The picture underneath are tires that were abandoned in a storage unit. Um, we do get calls on that somewhat frequently, unfortunately. Um, we have prosecuted some cases of tire dumping in situations like that. Um, you can see some of the variety of dumping complaints we get. Um, we get dumping complaints that are, you know, in the wild with trees growing through tires. We get dumping complaints of tires that are, are in rural area, or I'm sorry, urban areas where the tires are literally dumped between two houses in a, in a um, city environment. Um, the picture on the far right, that's one of our inspectors at a site where there were a lot of tires dumped and, and pushed around by heavy equipment. And unfortunately, sometimes we, we do experience a tire fire. Okay, next slide. 
talk a little bit about the grant program. Um, we offer three different types of grants um, on an annual basis, provided that we have funding available. Um, the first um, group of grants we do are cleanup grants, and the majority of those are community collection events. So your community could apply for scrap tire grant funding and they could have a cleanup day um, at the township hall. And those tires are, are then picked up and taken to a processor and appropriately processed and disposed of. We also occasionally will do a, a cleanup on a private property. Um, the one in the previous photograph with the inspector in it was, um, was a property that we did a private site cleanup on last year. Uh, there were approximately 80,000 tires on that site and there will be a lien placed on that property for repayment of the grant funding that was used. We also do law enforcement grants um, for agencies. You have to be a law enforcement agency to apply. We have bought some um, surveillance cameras for some places that have had um, tire dumping issues, historical tire dumping issues. Um, we're also doing a law enforcement grant with the city of Detroit to try to stop the urban dumping in the city of Detroit. And then the remaining funds we use to develop markets for tires. And we have all kinds, we support a lot of different technologies, development of technologies. Um, this year we're doing a rubber modified chip seal project where we're gonna try to do a hundred lane miles of rubberized chip seal to extend the life of the roads. That project will use approximately 290 scrap tires per lane mile. Um, so we're looking at maybe 29,000 tires or so. Um, very excited about that. We do rubberized paving via wet process, which is a terminal blend rubber um, or a dry process um, where rubberized powder is added to the material at the asphalt plant when it's mixed. Um, we do buy equipment for processors and the market development grants are actually a 50% match grant. So um, when we grant equipment grant, the, the grantee will pay for half of the price of the equipment and this in the state scrap tire program will reimburse them for the rest. Okay. The money for our program comes from a dollar fifty fee that is um, on a vehicle title transfer and that's collected by the Secretary of State. And we always ask, you know, there's nine inspectors and one of me, how can you help us with the program? Obviously extend the life of your tires, um, properly dispose of your old tires when you get new tires. Um, there is a big misconception that the state of Michigan um, sets the price that is charged for disposal. The state does not. All of our funding comes from that $1.50 fee. The retailers are allowed to set the price that they will charge to take your tires for disposal. The sad truth of it is many of them are using, you know, they're charging um, you $5 to take your scrap tire and they're paying $2 for disposal and then they're pocketing the $3 as a profit. Um, Unfortunately, we don't really have a mechanism to get involved with that, but that is kind of how, how it works. Um, if you know where there's a tire pile or something that just looks wrong, you see somebody hauling tires and they go to a building and then you notice that they're not, they don't have any tires when they leave and it, you know, notify us, we will go look at it. Um, the best way is the Eagle dash scrap tire mailbox or the 517-614-7431 phone number. And we will certainly take a look. Thank you, Kirsten. Mm -hmm. That was very informative. Well, I have to say I'm, I've learned a lot um, by listening to TJ and you, and I think our audience has as well. 
And they do have a, a couple questions and I think we have maybe about five minutes um, left for questions. So um, I encourage people to um, continue to put them in, in the chat box or Q&A box if you have a question, but I'm gonna start right off with a question right now um, for, this is for Kirsten. Um, the question says, my garbage hauler at the, at the house requires that the tire can be cut in half, either around the outside or crossways. Is this a state requirement? It is a state requirement, but not by the scrap tire program. It's actually a part 115 solid waste requirement because um, if you're going to dispose of tires in a landfill, the tire, a whole tire will accumulate landfill gas and flow to the top of the landfill, which causes problems at the landfill. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question here is for TJ. Um, it says that TJ indicated that overinflation helps very little. Is this even with heavier loading of vehicles, such as a pickup truck, empty versus loaded? Yeah, the load of a vehicle is kind of confusing to a lot of people. Uh, it's the load that determines the air pressure up to the maximum load carrying capacity of the tire. And for example, if you have a tire that carries 2,000 pounds, you got four vehicles, that's 8,000 pounds, and it and it all those tires require 80 PSI, that's what it requires to carry that. If you have less than that load, that max load it requires less air pressure. But if you have a higher load than the tires is spec'd out to carry, then that, that is like the biggest no-no that you can possibly have, it, you just can't. So the load on a commercial vehicle or any vehicle is set by whichever one is the lowest. So if you have a 5,000 pound pickup truck and you wanna carry 10,000 pounds, you have 10,000 pounds worth of load on the tire, you still cannot carry 10,000 pounds. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, another question for you, TJ. Um, it says daytime temperatures, especially during the heat of the summer can vary significantly between the morning and late afternoon. When should you check your and set your quote unquote cold tire pressure? if that car has not been driven. Yeah, and it's not so much in the summer as in the spring and the fall when the temperature can vary. It can have a really big delta of 30 degrees. As long as you check the tires cold, whether you check them that morning or that afternoon, or if you're driving the vehicle, let the vehicle sit for about an hour and then you can check the air pressure. Uh, the, the standard for the tire industry and the tire manufacturers is that you check the air pressure. And if you're not sure, if you check it on the cold side of the day, add one or two extra PSI. If you check it on the, the daytime when it's warmer than at night, then go ahead and put it at the required set point. Great. All right. Don't go away. We've got another one for you, TJ. Um, it says that my experience is that new tires are sold with the mileage warranty, such as 70,000 mile tread warranty. And there's no mention of an age limit. Is that just a marketing ploy because they don't want to admit that tires should be replaced every six years or so for safety? Well, they don't because, uh, because of liability. There's no law that says when a tire is gonna have to be replaced. There is that recommendation that we talked about earlier. After six years, each tire more than six years old needs to be inspected internally and externally every year up until 10 years. Now, commercial and fire apparatus is a little bit different. The warranties on those can go as high as seven years, but it ranges uh, very much. The, the standard on fire apparatus is actually set by the, the National Fire Protection Agency saying seven years is the max and they need to be removed from fire apparatus except on pumper trucks where they need to be removed after five years. All right. So here's another one for you. Is it against the law to replace a tire valve without the TPS? If the vehicle comes into the shop with the, with the tire pressure laid on and the cause is the tire valve TPS, can the customer refuse replacement due to the high cost of the TPS yes, they, tire valve? They can. And, and as I said earlier, the TPMS should not be used as an alert to check your tire pressure. You should still check your tire pressure every month. I know for it's kind of pain in the butt to bend that knee. I'm 6'4", and for me to bend a knee is a lot, man. I got to fold up to get on the ground. But yes, you can do that. The standards for TPMS were set in August of 2007 that all new vehicles after August of 2007 due to the Ford Firestone fiasco have to come with TPMS system, but it doesn't require you to, to have it con in continuous operation. All right. 
Well, I've got one now for Kirsten. Um, a question about why is lacing of tires an appropriate storage method? Well, we try to convince people to um, keep the tires piled as neatly as possible. And, and when you lace them, they actually stay um, really well organized in a much smaller space. We also suggest that if you can to keep your scrap tires either in a building or under cover so that there's not water in them for mosquito breeding habitat. Excellent. Well, let's see, it is 12 o'clock on the button here and we have quite a few more questions. Um, I'm thinking that it would be best for us to um, direct these to Kirsten um, or TJ. Their contact information um, is available um, through this webinar. Um, I want to keep everyone on schedule, and I'd really like to thank um, our presenters. TJ, I can't thank you enough for um, spending your morning with us and providing such a wealth of information. It was very helpful, especially when we're starting up here with some summer travel, which everyone is looking forward to. Um, so we've learned a lot about how important it is to maintain your tires for um, safety reasons, um, liability reasons, and environmental reasons. And Kirsten, you know, the, your um, grant pro program is um, incredibly helpful. Um, I, that is an annual grant program. So every year we have an opportunity to um, apply to that and seek some funds, secure some funds to help with um, proper um, tire collection and disposal. So um, with that, I wanna thank everyone so much for spending your day, your morning with us. And if you'd like to listen to the webinar again, it is being recorded, um, feel free to do so and to um, encourage others to take advantage of that. So thank you very much.